you to Nevada Week in Review. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce the media panel. <clears throat> Elizabeth Crum is editor of the Nevada News Bureau and political analyst at Channel 13 Action News. John Huck is an anchor with Fox 5 News. Steve Sebelius is editor of Las Vegas City Life and a member of the Channel 8 I team. And political commentator John Ralston hosts Face to Face on KVBC Channel 3. Longest introductions in the history of this show we got through it, though. Uh, let's talk about uh, Kenny Gwynn. All of you knew him, interviewed him frequently. Uh, he, he's being remembered as the everyman, but still the quintessential governor, particularly the way that he looked and carried himself and walked into a room. Uh, but there were a lot of Republicans, a lot of conservative Republicans, that didn't think that he was sort of the same cloth as they were, and he was uh, roundly criticized for a big tax increase. What will he be remembered? Will he be remembered for the tax increase, or Millennium Scholarship, or what? Elizabeth, first up. Uh, all of that uh, absolutely will be remembered uh, as a Republican governor who presided over the largest tax increase in the history of the state, which certainly caused a rift within his own party, and uh, people still argue about it to this day. Uh, but yeah, he was. Uh, everyone liked him, uh, certainly. Uh, Bill Raggio said some very nice things about him uh, this week, as did many of the legislators and, and the media. Um, liked him, a very uh, nice gentleman. Uh, well respected uh, around the state regardless and uh, the Millennium Scholarship uh, which is really a tremendous uh, program something that will certainly uh, be part of his legacy in, in years going forward. I think on a personal note uh, he was superintendent of the Clark County School District and really was primarily responsible for getting Vegas PBS Channel 10 on the air uh, at well, that particular Well, there's time. no reason so to sully the man's memory. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, uh, that's not appropriate. He would often say, I'm responsible for you having a job. He would, he would definitely say that. But um, education was at, at his core. I mean, when, even when he became governor, mm -hmm. Uh, so, much, so much of it revolved around the fact that he wanted to ensure that K-12 was properly funded and higher if you, ed. If you look back at his life story, I mean, he was born into poverty in Exeter, California, and he was, you know, we heard from someone who went to school with him, and he was always just very focused, and he knew, he, he seemed to know that education was his way out of that life. And, you know, that was a value that he had, and that's a value that, he, that was a part of his governorship. And he really was out of central casting. I mean, if Hollywood was to cast a Western governor, it would be Kenny Gwynn. And I remember when, hearing when he passed away, and I think a lot of people felt this, it's just that, you know, you look back, and that was, it felt like 100 years ago when he was governor. You know, Nevada was just very prosperous. It's, the, the government, Nevada state government, functioned at a slightly higher level, a little bit more, you know, congeal, you know, congeal, conge congenial, <laughs> congenial. Thank you. You're welcome. So, but I mean, it just it just reminds you of an era that has passed, and it's unfortunate. And just his death just kind of drove it home, I think, for people. You know, I think I think John is right about that. I mean, Carson City has changed as as Washington D.C. has changed, and it's much more polarized uh, than than it was during the time of Kennedy. Partly because of his personality, he really was. It's not just a cliche. Everyone's used the word, same words, decent, caring. He could bring people together. But you know what else? I think he's going to be remembered for maybe even longer than some of the things we've talked about is he was the first governor and I criticized Bob Miller for this and we got into it over it. Dick Bryan never talked about it. Kenny Gwynn was the first governor to talk about having a long-term plan for the state, uh, fixing the tax structure, fixing the way that we spend and, and, and raise money. He wanted to do something about that. He wanted to provide a, new, a, a, a stability to the tax base, which a lot of conservatives think, think thought was nonsense. Uh, and, and he and Bill Raggio were cut from the same cloth in the Republican Party where they said, as Raggio said, uh, after he died, compromise is not a four-letter word. But a lot of people who oppose Kenny Gwynn, and a lot of people certainly now, uh, on both sides, on both sides of the political spectrum, uh, I think it is a four-letter word. So I think Kenny Gwynn will be remembered as the, as the guy who first started talking about that. Whether it goes anywhere with, with the two people who are running for governor now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, the you know, I, I think... Carson City under Kenny Gwynn was the first time I really saw it polarized. It was extremely polarized during that 2003 session uh, and this debate over taxes. The, the, the personal animus on both sides of that issue uh, was palpable toward the end uh, of that session. And, uh, and it took a, a lawsuit, two special sessions to finally uh, resolve it. But John's absolutely right. This was something that needed to be done. And Kenny Gwynn rose above partisan labels and and slogans to get it done and it's it strikes me as odd that uh, that they would deride s people such as kenny gwynn and bill raggio as rhinos and they're not real republicans it's this odd tendency that the republicans have to eschew their their greatest most successful 
uh, members and uh, to embrace their least successful, most divisive members. Uh, e even Ronald Reagan, I think the, the Republican Party embraces an idea of what Ronald Reagan was that ha bears now no right. resemblance to the reality of what the man actually did while in office. And, and Kenny Gwynn, I would say, was quite Reagan-esque. Yeah. He, he had his rhetoric, he had his philosophy, he had his principles, but the number one principle that he had that he never betrayed was always do the best thing, the most right thing for the people of the state. And that's what he did in 2003 with the tax increase, that's what he did with the Millennium Scholarships, that's what he did even in privatizing SIIS. He did what he thought was the right thing for the state, and I think his legacy is, is going to be uh, the fact that he did those things. I think, you know, of all the quotes I saw, uh, uh, in the in the press reacting to his death, I think Brian Greenspun's the Las Vegas Suns was the best, which was, this state needs more Kenny Gwynns, and now we've lost the only one we ever had. Right. We've missed. And I him, think but that's uh, that's the most that's well, the know, most poignant one. you know, it's interesting too. I know you don't want to talk about Kenny Gwynn for the whole program, but real quickly, with Steve, it made me think about Reagan. One thing Reagan had, and it was very successful, helped him in politics, was he was an actor, right? Now he was he was a he was a B movie actor, <laughs> but he was an A. He was an apolitical actor, yeah. right? He knew how to sway people. Kenny Quinn didn't want to do any of that stuff. He didn't know how to do it, and he didn't understand all of that animosity that was going on. It wasn't even necessarily partisan. It was essentially a, a group of assembly Republicans because 90% of the Senate Republicans eventually voted for the tax. I may have to vote. It was 17 to 4, 18 to something, something like that. He couldn't understand it because uh, he... He thought he had done all this work. He understood the problems. Why wouldn't people listen to him? He just wanted to do the right thing. Whether or not he was right, he believed that, and he couldn't understand the vitriol that came from the likes of Bob Beers and others. He could not relate to it. Well, he was uh, apolitical, and, and you wrote about it in your column. I mean, he hated reading from a teleprompter and often mangled sentences. He would rather just get those things out of the way and just be extemporaneous. I'm going to quote from your, uh, your column, John, because I thought it was so well written. It said, Gwynn probably couldn't log on to a computer, but he could fit the whole human services budget on a napkin. And the guy was the consumer yeah. numbers cruncher. I mean, he was like numbers in his mind all the time. He surrounded himself with plenty of hardball players, but Gwynn, ever the conciliator, never took the bat off his shoulder. So you could actually have that hands-off approach but it was infuriating too, though, Mitch, and I wrote about that because that that stopped him from getting things done. I mean, the guys like Steve and I, we watched this up close. If he'd been willing to do certain things that he was just unwilling to do to play hardball politics, I think he could have been more successful in what he wanted to do. He got the number, most of the number he wanted to get in that tax increase, but it wasn't. It didn't look anything like what he had proposed. It was this mishmash of of unconnected policy initiatives, uh, and now it just looks it looks bad in hindsight. It looked terrible at the time. Uh, uh, but now it looks just terrible because he was not willing to really do what you needed to do to get something through. And during a second gubernatorial campaign, you've argued, I think, that he could have pushed more for that overall restructuring of the tax system and that corporate income tax, if you want to call it income tax, and he really didn't. He didn't talk about it at all. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, I, I, uh, that was written about many times. He didn't talk about it at all. And then, post-election, claimed a mandate to do it well, for something he hadn't talked about at all, which I thought was, was overplaying his hand. Also overplaying his hand was telling those 15 very recalcitrant Republicans in the assembly that they were irrelevant. They were most certainly not irrelevant as they proved through months and months of special sessions and lawsuits and contentions. And it was finally only, you know, John Marvel uh, breaking at the end that got, even as John described it, you know, this, this pale shadow of what Kenny Gwynn actually wanted to do passed. Well, you know, Millennium Scholarship, we talked about that. Ironically, the day before the man passed right. away, the Interim Finance Committee stepped up and actually funded it for a year. I thought that was just, it was just kind of strange, weird in a way. Yeah, it is, it is ironic, and that was one of the things that he was proud of, and it goes back to his, you know, belief that education. One thing I wanted to bring up, you know, you, you can dissect the man's record, but he had a common touch with people, and we've been hearing from a lot of people who've written us just saying, you know, we were in a restaurant, and he came up, and he talked to my son who was in a military uniform, or he did this, he helped, you know, rebuild this house that we were working on for Habitat for Humanity. I mean, he just had that common touch that you just don't see in politicians anymore. You know, politicians are just, they, they've sealed themselves off in this bubble. They just don't want to deal with ordinary voters. And I think that's why he had such a high approval rating on his way out of office, because Nevadans, you know, they're not like, you know, the, the partisans on either side. They recognize success, and they appreciate what he did, and, 
you know. I thought it was interesting uh, the family uh, put out, you know, they started a, a memorial millennium scholarship fund and, and asked uh, folks instead of sending flowers in lieu of that to, uh, to fund that uh, because that was, uh, you know, he, he, he loved that. That was something that was very important to him and that people will remember him for. And I, I, I was very touched by that. I thought that was uh, very appropriate for the family it to do that. has his name on it now too, right? Right. The, the scholarship has his name on it. And, you know, I bet he would have been distressed by what the you know yeah. finance committee did because it was yet another Band-Aid way. Work, right? They saved right. it for just One a year. little while. Right. Uh, you know, in some ways it was crazy the way they funded it in the first place right. with the tobacco money, which theoretically was not supposed to be used for anything except health care <laughs> initiatives, but, but they got around that. But the idea itself, you know, and, and I think I think he was, I know from, from talking to his friends that, that he was very, very upset about what was happening in this state with the economy, that he was worried about the future of education, which he did talk about. I think he said in one of his state of the states, you know, education is not part of my agenda. It is my agenda. So some line like that he had. And so he was he was very distraught about what was going on in, in the state and to see what was happening to the Millennium Scholarship, especially, I think. I did want to take a look at uh, the angle read.